Hello everybody, just before we get into this week's episode, just a quick announcement to say that we've got some really fun events happening over the Halloween weekend. One in London and one up north in Bradford. So first of all, on the 29th of October, I'm going to be at the uh, Science and Media Museum in Bradford for a special screening of Stephen Volk's Ghost Watch. This is, of course, the classic, terrifying found footage movie celebrating its 30th anniversary. It aired on on our TVs back in 1992 on Halloween night. So it's going to be a special 30th anniversary screening and it's going to be hosted by friend of the pod Adam Robinson. I'm going to be there on a panel discussion with Adam and so is Becky Dark uh, after the screening. And then we'll be hanging out afterwards to chat to listeners and audience members. So if you can make it to that, please grab your ticket now while they last. You can find a link to grab your ticket in the show notes but that's going to be at the science and media museum in bradford on saturday the 29th of october from 7 p.m then on actual halloween night that's monday the 31st of october i'm going to be back down in london for a special screening of Creature from the Black Lagoon from 1954. This is going to be a really fun, spooky event. Uh, It's going to be at the oldest cinema in London. That's the Regent Street Cinema. It's a beautiful building, beautiful cinema. Um, And as well as the screening, there's going to be a panel discussion afterwards with Becky Dark and friends of the pod Jamie Graham and Layla Latif. Uh, The Regent Street Cinema also have this really cool vintage organ as well. And there's going to be a special musical interview with some organ music and then there'll be some drinks in the bar afterwards so cannot wait for that please grab your ticket to that again while tickets last and join us on Halloween night that's the 31st of October at the Regent Street Cinema and I will also post a link to the tickets for that one in the show notes By the mid-90s, vampire movies were big business. After big hits like Fright Night, The Lost Boys and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, vampire films had broken into the mainstream, and some of Hollywood's biggest directors and A-list stars were getting involved in bringing vampire stories to the big screen. I've come to answer your prayers. In 1994, Neil Jordan adapted Anne Rice's 1976 novel Interview with the Vampire. Thanks to its big budget, glamorous costumes and A-list cast, the film went on to achieve huge commercial and critical success. Okay, Ramblers, let's get rambling. A couple of years later, Hollywood's hottest writer and director, Quentin Tarantino, wrote and starred in his own vampire film, which blended tropes of the crime genre with schlocky 70s exploitation cinema. Buddy, be cool. You be cool. Between them, Interview with the Vampire and From Dust Till Dawn boasted casts that included George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise, Antonio Banderas, Juliette Lewis, Salma Hayek, Kirsten Dunst and Harvey Keitel. Welcome to slavery. Solidifying the vampire movie as the most bankable and commercially successful subgenre in horror. I want some more. Join me as we continue exploring the evolution of the vampire and we discuss Interview with the Vampire and From Dusk Till Dawn. Welcome back to the Evolution of Horror. My name is Mike Munzer and as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres one series at a time. We are currently in the middle of our eighth series exploring the evolution of the vampire movie and this is part 17. This week, as that intro suggested, we're going to be covering two big budget 90s classics from Dust Till Dawn and Interview with the Vampire. Both of these discussions will be spoilerific. 
give them both a watch before you listen to our discussion. So joining me to discuss these 90s classics, I've got a 90s expert with me. She is, of course, a longtime friend of the pod and very good friend of mine. Welcome back, Becky Dark. Hi, Becky. Hi, Mike. Hello. How are you? I'm all right, thanks, pal. Nice to be back. It's so nice to have you back, to be have you back here on Main, because, you know, obviously we do Patreon stuff together all the time, like Fresh Blood and Dream Warriors episodes, but the last time you were here on the main podcast in our Alien series, right, what were we discussing? It was uh, Event Horizon. We were, yeah, we were doing Lovecraftian spooks. Oh, so uh, that like from a while ago, it was ages ago. From mm. Beyond and um, Event Horizon, and we've talked about all sorts of shit since then. <laughs> we've done a lot. Of <laughs> God, a lot of shit since then. Absolutely. Um, let me ask you about vampires. Then, what what do you think of the vampire subgenre? Are you a fan of it? I'm a really, really big fan of vampires. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, I would say probably after kind of uh, like a cult and then ghosts, vampires is probably my third favourite, maybe tied with serial killers. Um, But vampires kind of sort of are a sort of serial killer, really, aren't they? They're just like sexy serial killers and their weapons are sort of inbuilt in their mouths inbuilt ready to go (laughs) ready to go yeah Yeah. I really I really really like vampires I like that if you say to somebody this is a vampire film that can mean so many different things like there are yes it's a subgenre that then has so many subgenres and sub sub subgenres and um I think it's you know the the monster of the vampire has just been utilized in so many disparate and interesting ways um Mm -hmm. i love it when they're scary i love it when they're sexy i love it when they're frilly i love it when they're sort of leathery um i like it when they've got powers i like it when they don't have powers and they just sort of cut people with a bit of metal and then suck the blood out of their necks i don't know what it is i love a vamp yeah i mean we probably one of the earliest things we bonded over was our love of buffy Mm -hmm. right you know so and that's your what favorite tv show of all time is a, is a vampire all, show yeah absolutely um very much a vampire show and uh has a bit of i mean you know we'll talk about this because we're talking about 90s vampire films mm. today but mm-hmm. you know that buffy's good because it's got the sort of frills and the romance but it's all it's also got the kind of the scares and um yeah. like the the use of vampires in that film uh, in, in the film and in the TV show, really, uh, mm. had so much influence kind of going forwards. And I feel like there's there's stuff with the two films that we're going to talk to talk about today that kind of both of them sort of like work with that in some ways yeah. and the stuff that then sort of came on after. So Yeah, it is interesting um, that, you know, a lot of the people I've spoken to so far this series haven't said that it's one of their favourite subgenres. And I think there is this weird disparity as well of, especially maybe around the era we're about to talk about, where vampires maybe become a bit too mainstream, a mm. bit too, you know, almost like not edgy enough for some horror fans or something. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, maybe. Um, mm. It's funny, I was because I know that you're going to inevitably ask me what my favourite vampire film is and I don't have an answer for you, so be prepared for that. Um, (laughs) But I was kind of thinking about, you know, when I was most into, uh, sort of in my horror journey, Mm. at what stage of that I was most into vampires. And to be honest, it probably was the sort of the 90s and the, the more kind of romantic and cool slick vampire films Mm -hmm. and that kind of because I was the age I was sort of hooked me nice and early and then what I've really enjoyed is kind of then exploring all the different and let's face it slightly more interesting versions of vampires Mm. so like Mm -hmm. the really monstrous ones the slightly camp gothic ones the um, the sort of grainy ones in the 70s where it's all a, um mm. allegory for like drug use and then 80s uh, AIDS and all of that kind of thing. Yeah, um, yeah. And then, yeah, like the sort of the 
the slightly bigger budget stuff as well. Like I, I really enjoy stuff like Blade and all of that. Like it's mm. just such a versatile monster. So it doesn't bother me that in some respects it's quite mainstream because I feel like if you look hard enough, you can always find something that's still like really subversive. Yeah. And also like we just talked about this on this month's Fresh Blood, didn't we? But uh, Robert Eggers is now about to do a Nosferatu. And I really feel like maybe this could be the film that make vampires truly scary again, make, which they feel like they haven't been in a long time. Do you know what I mean? So that's quite exciting. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm really, really excited about that. If anybody can um, bring a bit of fright back to um, mm-hmm. vampires, I'm sure Eggers can do the job. Do you think like, and maybe we'll talk about this more and figure it out as we talk about these movies, but what do you think changed in the 90s? Like vampire movies were so kind of, weird and indian niche in the 70s let's say there were a lot of like weird european arty sort of films or there were these kind of black exploitation films but now we're at the point where we're about to talk about movies starring george clooney tom cruise mm. brad pitt like what happened to make vampires suddenly be this mainstream by this point do you think it's got to be something about something really is sort of um commercial as like Mm. they just started making money so so in the 90s all of a sudden you're getting the bigger budget as you say they've got like these proper proper a-list hollywood heartthrobs which not only are pulling in you know um uh, their, their, their adaptation so things like Interview with the Vampire is you know a huge adaptation of a really mm. already famous book but then you put actors like Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt and Christian Slater and Antonio Banderas in that film like I mean, you're laughing all the way to the bank. And then you've <laughs> yes. got and then you've got um directors and writers like Tarantino and and mm. Rodriguez who are coming on board and doing so it's still it's still sort of edgy and indie, but it's mm. glossy enough that it's got somebody like um George Clooney this huge yeah. heartthrob attached to it. And even though, like, I know, again, we'll come on to talk about this, but even though he isn't actually playing the vampire, the heartthrob vampire in it, he is all over the front of the posters, you know, yeah. and also, of course, it wasn't super obvious at first that that was going to be a vampire film. So it's not <laughs> it's yeah. not like everybody's looking at the poster and going, oh, cool, it's a vampire film with George Clooney in it. Let's go and see this. But as soon as like that basically became clear, I think it gave um, it sort of gave way to to allow heartthrobs mm. and and people and like you know young women um and um young queer men who maybe weren't super into um the the vampires or the the horror films straight away but they are into brad pitt and tom cruise and george clooney and it's like okay yeah we're yeah. We're, we're interested in this now so true and i'm sure part of that also must have been a lot from from the lost boys as well oh, joe schumacher's the lost boys right yeah. which he, just like you said, I think suddenly for 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 women and for queer men, suddenly you had these amazing, you know, Kiefer Sutherland right. and all of those others, these incredibly sexy and vampires making it cool, you know, dripping in leather. They've got tattoos, yeah. you know. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I mean, it's it, there's so much about vampires that are sexy, and you know, you have spoken about this so much in all of the previous episodes mm. um, about the um the 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 way that being bitten is you know it's sexy like you're yeah. penetrating you're sucking fluids um mm. it's it's warm and it's close and it's intimate um and also like even though you're kind of being killed there is this this or this danger this sort of morbid fascination that we have from horror this terror of being killed you're not really killed because if you come back you are better, potentially better than yourself. And I think that's something else that um, vampire films started doing at this point is not, you don't necessarily come back as this blood sucking fiend, like this monster. You come back as the cool kids, right? Yeah. So and, and it's, it's attractive. Bit, it's so true. And it's a bit of both, isn't it? We'll see this in Interview with the Vampire where like, 
it, it explores the pros and cons of being a vampire basically and this is what we get a lot of from about this point onwards this idea of yeah you live you stay young and beautiful forever but mm-hmm. you you have to live forever like mm-hmm. there are downsides to that as well kind of thing so yeah it's really interesting from the novel by Anne Rice from Neil Jordan the director of The Crying Game I've come to answer your prayers life has no meaning anymore does it? His name is Lestat. But what if I could give it back to you? Pluck out the pain and give you another life. One you could never imagine. I can see you lying on a bit of satin. He chose one man. He gave him infinite power. Eternal life. Tom Cruise. Brad Pitt. Stephen Ray. Antonio Banderas, Kirsten Dunst, and Christian Slater. Interview with the Vampire. Interview with the Vampire, first of all, then. Um, So this is from 1994, uh, directed by Neil Jordan. Um, Becky, set the scene for us. What is the story of Interview with the Vampire? So Christian Slater is the titular interviewer Mm -hmm. and Brad Pitt is the titular vampire and you start the film where uh, Christian Slater's journalist has um, he's got uh, the vampire in the room. He's initially a sort of incredulous cynic, um, but quickly comes round to believe that um, this is a real life vampire standing in front of him. Mm. And Brad Pitt's vampire, Louis, wants to tell his story. He's been alive for 200 years. Um, he's been all over the world looking for the answers behind Uh, vampirism. He's had a lot of tumultuous relationships with sexy men in um, New Orleans and Paris. And he had an unusual relationship with a young girl who then grew up into an adult vampire, but stayed as a young girl. And so was kind of Mm -hmm. his daughter and also his protege and also like his sort of sister and it's all you know very yes. complicated um and so <laughs> most of the film is told out um as kind of a flashback as a as a long um years spanning flashback of mm. louis's life from when he was first turned by um the vampire lestat played by tom cruise um and all of his kind of Uh, struggles with being a vampire up to the sort of present day where he is now and he's 200 years old and is desperate to tell his story yes exactly yeah and actually it's it's one of those weird films where in in my head it always feels like such an epic because it spans so much time Mm. and but actually the plot is kind of relatively simple it's sort of like he finds the stat they have all this time together they have a sort of daughter then they all split apart he finds antonio banderas for a bit and then he kind of goes off and wanders by himself and that's sort of it really isn't it and it's just kind of him like going from sort of place to place with different people um so yeah what's your sort of history with this film do you remember when you first discovered it and and what do you think of this movie generally i really like interview with the vampire i think it's um i don't think it's perfect i think it's got some flaws which we'll come on to um But I was 12 when it came out. So I was very much the kind of, yeah, I was very (laughs) much the target audience for this movie. I was a 12 year old girl in 94 (laughs) when Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt and Antonio Banderas and Christian Slater were their absolute hottest and highest A-list kind of points. Um, Mm -hmm. Plus, I was a spooky little bitch who really loved horror and (laughs) vampires and stuff. So I really like this movie was very much made for me when it kind of first when it first came out. I don't think I saw it at the cinema, but I would have seen it pretty much immediately when it came out on VHS. I think I would have first seen it. um, Yeah. Rented from Blockbuster, I would assume. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and what did you and do do you still kind of have the same feelings about it now watching it again this week i have a lot of 
um, 90s nostalgia for it. Mm. I've seen this film countless times. I know the beats. Um, it's it's absolutely at that. It's one of the ones that we used to watch at sleepovers, you know, with with teenage girlfriends um, because of all the hot boys in it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I still really enjoy it. It's one that I can put on very, very comfortably and have it on in the background. And what... <laughs> What I have come to realise and what I think I realised at the time, but definitely what has kind of solidified with me, um, maybe I'm I'm clearer on my thoughts, is that this is a movie of two halves and the first half is really, really good and the second half isn't quite as good. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so I think that it's got a huge amount of charm. It's got some great performances. Um, but as a 40-year-old, I can slightly suspend the swooning of all the hunky vamps um, and look at it slightly more critically and be like, would have been better if you kept Tom Cruise around for a bit, wouldn't it? And also, like, why when they get to Paris, can you just not understand a word that anybody says? Like, there's just so much I, mumbling. I had to put the subtitles on. Did you? <laughs> yeah. I think when I was younger, I just used to assume that maybe my attention span wasn't there and I just got a bit bored and therefore I never paid that much attention. No, it's the film's fault. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. All of a sudden, it just becomes like really, really difficult to follow and there's just just lots and lots of moping and mumbling in dark um, sort of crypts and, you know, like the underground Paris theatres and stuff. Um, still some really cool imagery. The costumes are incredible and that. But really, at the halfway point, I do find that it slightly drops off. Yeah. I mean, you took the words out of my mouth there. And actually, it's, it's really, I mean, it's weird because we paired these films up together, <laughs> partly because you wanted to talk about these two films, right? But also, I kind of thought they have a good thematic similarity in that they're both these big A-list starring mainstream vampire films of the similar era. But also... I'm finding that I have the same reaction to both. We'll, we'll get to this a bit more later. Is that they are both a films films of two halves, yeah. and there is a certain half I prefer to another half in both films. And yes, I completely agree with you. I, I th- so much about this film is um, is just great. Like, it, and it's there's something about it that's really seductive oh, and definitely. sumptuous. And every time I put it on, I've probably seen it about four times now. And every time I put it on, I enjoy just sinking into it. You know, you can just like get comfortable. And there's something really enjoyable and seductive about just being in this world. I think partly because you're seeing so many amazing starry people in it. Yep. I think that definitely has a lot to do with it. The costumes are amazing. Um, and it's, it's you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of fun to just get lost in this world. But yeah, there is also an element of it for me that I find drags. And story-wise, it doesn't feel like, I don't know whether it offers much to like for me really beyond the costumes and the stars mm. and how amazing it looks and how sumptuous it is. Um, and I guess, pers- again, you know, we talked about this when we talked back in the day about Buffy the Vampire Slayer in 1992. I wasn't a teenage girl when this came out. I wasn't necessarily the target audience. It it maybe isn't the sort of vampire film that was made for me. And I think for me, there's something that just doesn't quite connect. So I kind of watch it as a bit of a superficial fun watch but that's sort of it and I agree with you Tom Cruise is incredible and I think the moment we lose Tom Cruise halfway through and we switch him for Antonio Banderas who I usually love but his character I find a bit bland and it just loses momentum for me in the second half completely. It absolutely grinds to a halt. (laughs) It does, it's weird isn't it and it should be more fun like this kind of pack of theatre performers and I don't know this kind of like almost vaudeville kind of vibe that we suddenly move into in the second half with Stephen Rare's character as well but it yeah like you said it grinds to a halt in a weird way doesn't it's it bizarre. it's bizarre really yeah one thing I do um you sort of say about the story and stuff and you're absolutely right you know it's not it's not plot heavy but I think definitely as a younger consumer of um vampire films horror films what it does is it 
gives you a really lovely glimpse into kind of classical vampire lore and ca- classical yeah. vampire iconography. Mm. Um, and you have really lovely moments where uh, that's actually kind of discussed like really overtly. So um, the journalist, um, Christian Slater's character, literally sort of asks um, yes. Louis, you know, um, uh, you know, what about crucifixes? And Louis says, oh, well, actually, I'm quite fond of them. What about stake yeah. through the heart? Oh, no, that's nonsense. Yeah. What about coffins? And he's like, oh, yeah, well, coffins are a necessity. And then you kind of get, then it all flash from the interview mm-hmm. back to, like, kind of setting the scene about why coffins are necessary. And then mm. you get lovely moments later when um, uh, Claudia... <laughs> has her own little coffin and it's so creepy because she's got that beautiful like white children size coffin and she sort of pops the top off of it and comes (laughs) out and goes and like crawls in with Louis in his one because she he's like he's like her dad and she needs all comforting and stuff um so there's a lot of that and I love all this stuff about um a kind of a sire sort of teaching Mm. the next generation of vampires. And there's this theme that runs throughout the film of um, Louis kind of searching for answers, searching for like why vampires are. Um, And one of the reasons he gets so frustrated with Lestat is because he can't give him those answers. But he will still let him in on, um, like, he's still teaching him about how to be a vampire, how to be Mm. a vampire. Maybe not like why, but how. So he's, he gives us glimpses into the different powers that vampires have. You know, can they read minds or can they not? Um, Mm. We see them having kind of super strength and all of that kind of thing. So, like, definitely, I think it's a really it's a really brilliant film at painting that picture of um, what a classical vampire is to a certain extent. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And for a a generation of people, that's, that's a real gateway into the vampire. You know, I I expect for a lot of people, Anne Rice was their Bram Stoker, right? Like, Mm -hmm. you you know, a lot of young people would have read Anne Rice before they read read Dracula, for example. Um, And yeah, for for better or worse, I think Anne Rice sort of changed the vampire subgenre really with with stories like this right and portrayals of vampires like this and we've seen a bit of this in films already over the last 10 years or so leading up to this this idea of you know when you become a vampire you join a new sort of surrogate family almost that's like that's very much lost boys that's near dark yeah you know this idea of kind of choosing your own family um and also this kind of slightly more queer aspect as well of becoming a vampire like again that that is all like front and center of this Anne Rice story in this movie isn't it I think absolutely know. front and center yeah there's some really there's some really hot stuff going on in this film between Ooh. like Brad Pitt and Antonio Banderas and Brad Pitt and and Tom Cruise I remember when you were watching it you were just taking screenshots of them <laughs> essentially like nuzzling at each other's necks and sending them through I was like keep this content coming it's brilliant I know it's so funny it's like we are sort of beyond subtext by this point, right? Oh, yeah. What's really interesting is that it's it's not... But also, it still is kind of subtext, but it's really not. It's almost the most obvious subtext you've ever seen. But you never actually see two men kiss or have sex with each other in this movie, for example. You right? don't. You don't. Again, it's all done through the the vampirism, the neck biting, the mm. the wrist biting. Um, yeah. One of them will sort of <laughs> like like cut themselves, and the other will sort of drink from him. You know, it's all yeah. very um, up close and personal. But there are there are you know they. I think this one does go a little further than, um, say, The Lost Boys, for example. I know you were talking to Jamie um, about how it was very much more subtext and audiences when it was first released just wouldn't necessarily have read, certainly sort of straight cis audiences wouldn't have read it as um, in, in any way kind of queer coded. In this, you know, they are calling each other the men are calling each other beautiful. Um, yeah. Lestat and Louis talk about Claudia being their daughter. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, so yeah, it's you don't. You're right. There's no kind of. There's no overt like, like sexual sex. But mm. I, you know, there's all of that penetration and definitely a bit more of the kind of like 
life partner stuff, like the relationship mm-hmm. stuff, this idea that they are, um, that they've, they've got this sort of daughter together. And I think that's cool. Yeah, totally. And, you know, this is something I talked about before, but, you know, this is probably about as gay as a mainstream film could have gotten at this point with A-list stars, right? You know, and it's really funny how vampires, lesbian vampires have always been so prominent, obviously, you know, in the 70s, there was overt lesbian sexuality on screen. But of course, because of all these movies are made by men, there was none of that with two men until way later, maybe Mm. something like True Blood, you know, in, in terms of mainstream entertainment where we actually got two men actually being gay together as vampires do you know what i mean um, but again this movie is it it's almost there but it still doesn't quite go as far as even the 70s lesbian vampire movie absolutely you know? and also in terms of it being two men they are both very femme coded so yeah. um, you know they've both got long hair they've both got long nails tom cruise and um, brad pitt are both very classically beautiful men Mm. um they're both sort of in these frilly outfits and and running their long nails against kind of diaphanous curtains and things (laughs) like it's not like these are a couple of leather daddies going at it in the back of a bar you know um so even though it is it's nudging up against this this real kind of male queer storyline. It's still it's playing it quite safe in a lot of ways. Mm, yeah, you're you're so right. It's almost like Jane Austen imagery amongst yeah. this kind of you know death and sex and stuff. It's really interesting, <laughs> isn't it? Um, are you familiar at all with the original? Did you ever read the Anne Rice books? Or no, no, I've never I've never read them. I was too busy reading Point Horror. Maybe. Exactly, it's other things to read, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, I, I think it's just really interesting that you know I think that the book was published in the seventies, right? And I think and a few of my previous guests have said this already that even by the time the books came out, you could see their influence on vampire movies that even vampire movies of the 80s like the hunger oh axel carolyn my guest that week sort of said that definitely you can see owed a debt to Anne rice you know and Anne rice's literature even by that point you know so that's really interesting that's I think. so that interesting influence was already there yeah yeah because i mean um, they were hugely popular right i mean like like you know, flying off the shelves popular as far as I understand it. Exactly, which I guess is why we have this big, big mainstream film made by Warner Brothers and of course starring this incredible cast. Maybe we should, let's talk about this cast. I mean, (laughs) Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, Stephen Ray, Antonio Banderas, Christian Slater and Kirsten Dunst. Among Honestly. many others. Incredible, Honestly. right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely incredible. amazing. Um, where to even... Well, let's start with Brad Pitt. What do you think of Brad Pitt in this as our... He's our, our hero, our guide through this whole story, isn't he? I think he's fine. I like Brad Pitt. Um, yeah, he's great. Yeah, yeah, hot take. Brad Pitt's quite good. Um, <laughs> he, I don't think it's his best role. I mean, he's he hasn't actually considering he's very much at the center of this film as you say it's his story he's our guide he hasn't actually got that much to do no he's sort of the straight well straight character (laughs) of this isn't he he's he's our harry potter he's our slightly more bland main character he's really bland he's so bland like (laughs) he's just he's very mopey he's very he's very angel reading sartre in the original french by a by a um (laughs) open fireplace and being mopey isn't he like he's all kind of torture and guilt and oh it's life is so hard life was hard when i was a human and now life's still hard while i'm a vampire um and what tom cruise is really great at doing is being really fucking cross at him all the way through the film for being really mopey yes absolutely well and and i guess brad pitt you know he he this was early in his career Mm. And even a year later, or two years later, he would be in David Fincher's Seven, right? And what an amazing mm. acting gig that was for him in comparison to right the, to what what had come before it. But I think at this point, he was basically just this very beautiful man, right? He was essentially a model. He had been in Thelma and Louise again as this just beautiful, objectified man. He didn't really get the kind of meaty roles in this regard and I think you can see why he's cast as the main character in this as this slightly bland but beautiful main character absolutely I mean we talked about Seven and Mm. I know we spoke specifically (laughs) 
about the moment right at the end of the film when you see more emotions go over Brad Pitt's face in approximately six seconds than you do in this entire film. Yes. Like when he's when he's holding the gun to John Doe's head because oh. he's just figured out what's in the box. And he keeps doing that thing where he looks like he's about to burst into tears, but then he pulls it together and then he looks like he's going to shoot him and then he pulls it together. Like mm-hmm. literally more he does more in that moment than he does throughout the whole of um, Interview with the Vampire as Louis. You're so right. You're so <laughs> right. It's so funny. But then, of course, we have Tom Cruise. Tom who, Cruise. Like, oh, my God. I mean, and, and I guess at this point, relatively, he was actually a much bigger name in a way than Brad Pitt at definitely. this point. Oh, Tom Cruise definitely. Tom Cruise been a, a superstar for a long time by this point, hadn't he? Um, but always playing heroes and good guys pretty much until this point, which is interesting. And, you know... Tom Cruise, he's a controversial figure. I know he's a bit mad, but I do think he's an amazing on-screen presence, right? Don't you think? Like, he's... Every time I watch him in something, I'm like, oh, he he does have a kind of natural charisma. He's like a proper movie star, isn't oh, he? That's the thing. Of course I think so. I mean, in, and in another... Coming back to our seven chat, um, Kevin Spacey... Yes. Kevin Spacey, this phenomenal actor mm-hmm. who really we're kind of now not really allowed to like anymore, which is a shame because he used <laughs> to be one of my favorites tom cruise is another one that as you say every time you see him in something he is the best value he's incredibly talented he's got the most unbelievable on-screen charisma Mm -hmm. Um, he's a really good actor he has been in some fucking brilliant films he chooses Um, his films really carefully chooses his films really great and also like he you know with with all the top gun top gun stuff um you know you're right he is a proper movie star he Mm. knows how to be a movie star Mm. um and he's just another one a bit like kevin spacey that it makes me sad because i'm like oh my god i'd forgotten how great tom cruise was and then i sort of remember how he's he's a bit problematic and (laughs) he's a bit mad (laughs) he's a bit mad and you know he's technically like the leader of a cult and all of that like bad stuff you know bad, bad stuff, stuff. Bad but stuff. he is an extremely good actor and one of one of the longest standing like high grossing proper proper a list movie yes. stars that's still going well i think he's once again proven this year right just how and I, I think this is something i was reading an article about this recently about how this is something that is almost dying out a little bit this idea that a movie star will sell a movie more than the story than what is based on than the director but just a movie star will sell the film mm. and it, there aren't that many people that can do that now you'd think that maybe people like robert downey jr or chris evans would but actually they don't when they do stuff outside of marvel uh, tom cruise whatever he does and he chooses his films carefully but whatever he does is a smash right and top gun maverick has been the biggest grossing film yeah. of the year of the last three years or something apparently so yeah it's it's he is one of those like kind of old school classic movie stars that we it feels like we don't have anymore you know completely and this role mm. is a really old school classic movie star role you know it is. he's yeah. he's handsome he's really kind of going for it you know he's not playing it subtle he's not holding anything back he is all maniacal laughter and he mm-hmm. takes you know he uh, Lestat and Louis are at such odds because Lestat takes such pleasure and joy in being a vampire and living yeah. the life of a vampire and Louis takes no pleasure in it at all mm. and what you kind of get from that is is this thing I think where Tom Cruise he's just a lot more fun to watch because he's enjoying himself because his character is enjoying himself and unfortunately Brad Pitt is just a bit dour in it and like he looks very pretty but he's just a bit boring and then as we kind of alluded to earlier what happens is when Tom Cruise um, and Lestat leave the film you're left with slightly dour Louis and then he goes and meets another dour guy in Paris and it all just slows down a bit you like Tom Cruise does so much to balance out that first Mm. half of the film with his like absolute kind of manic energy and like he delivers some of the best lines in this film he is so so good. good yeah he's got that kind of very he's got that sort of camp 
um, sort of slight bitchiness about oh, it, as well as being really terrifying, you know? He is such a bitch. Yeah, yeah he's amazing. And, like, it's cool as well. I, I love the makeup in this movie. Um, you get very, very subtle, um, you know, like the veins, like mm. alabaster, you know, their mm-hmm. alabaster skin and their contacts like tiny sort of turquoise veins on their skin just showing through. Um, And then you get it right up the other end of the scale where (laughs) Tom Cruise has just been like almost eaten by alligators in a swamp and he's had his throat (laughs) slit and and he comes back and, and like, I love that you kind of get him in that absolutely like pristine... um, Mm. Uh, New Orleans, Mississippi, uh, oh, kind of yeah. uh, Lestat, and then you get him really sort of psychotic and petty and bitchy, mm-hmm. and he's sort of like coming apart at the seams a little bit, and then you get him really truly monstrous as the film goes on. Yes. Um, and even yeah. though we do lose him to a certain extent, you don't lose him completely, and so he comes back when Louis returns to New Orleans. He comes back mm. right at the end in San Francisco. So he is this kind of enduring presence throughout the film, and I love how he just gets more and more fucked up as the film goes on. <laughs> <laughs> so good used to scare me when i was a kid because i first saw this when i was pr- probably shortly after it came out i would have been about eight or nine years old because i had two older sisters that of course teenage girls they they loved this <laughs> and i remember it used to really scare me when you see him you know playing the piano and his oh. face is all rotten and you know it is he's he's a proper scary villain whilst being you know incredibly entertaining i think isn't he you totally know? yeah absolutely yeah. um and then there and then there's little Kirsten Dunst as oh well God. the daughter and again she's incredible like again the, the film kind of really that that's a great segment there as well when the three of them are being like this little unconventional family it's my favourite it? bit by yeah. far yeah everyone's so favourite bit by far probably definitely definitely it's so fun isn't it and it's fucked up because of course she's really vicious as well so it's there's, great there, it's not a montage but there's that sort of very in quick succession um, set of scenes where she she kills the dressmaker and then eats the woman on the bench, kills her piano teacher, kills the doll maker to steal the doll. And I love her interactions with Tom Cruise throughout that, where he just gets increasingly irritated, but not for the reason that we would be put yes. out by this like she's killing innocent people um he's irritated because he's like oh well now we're gonna have to hire a new piano teacher now you know well we, what? <laughs> or the, you <laughs> why know, have they, you left she, this mess for us yes, to catch, it's, you know? she's always making a mess she's leaving dead bodies in amongst her te- like dolls in yeah. her bedroom and they're like oh tusk 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 yeah it's <laughs> it's, it's, it's really funny all that stuff is brilliant and like again kirsten dunst is just like instantly a film star isn't she at this moment you i mean know? for me the most and this is probably because it was like in the tv trailer or Mm -hmm. it will have been on the trailer on the beginning of another vhs that i watched a lot like something like that but when her when she sits up and she's gone from grubby little half dead waif and they've turned her and her curls all like come up all perfectly and glossy and she basically turns into a little doll before our eyes Mm. and then she sits up and she whispers i want some more that is the that is the moment for me that i always remember over all other moments and it's Mm -hmm. all her you get that beautiful tight close-up on her face and you suddenly see the transformation Mm. um and they they're so clever with all of that because you then get it later where she chops all her hair off (gasps) and that's a really emotional moment because you know she's older by that point she's realizing that actually her body's never going to change um she is and you know this is something that you talked about in um your chat about near dark as well the the child vampire in that you get it later as a trope in um things like twilight um this idea and also this idea that it's like it's sort of against the rules. They're like mm. these little abominations, right? Mm. You're not supposed to do it to kids. Yes. Um, and you see as time goes on during this film, how she 
is growing up ma- like she's maturing internally but obviously her body isn't changing and mm. so to try and change her appearance in any way she hacks off all her hair like really kind of like crudely with those scissors mm-hmm. and then she flounces out of the room as she's very good at doing so there's a lot of flouncing out of rooms in this film um <laughs> yes and then you just hear that scream from off screen and it comes in and all her curls have grown back and mm-hmm. that is such a sinister little moment it's amazing it's really good and this is what this story is really good at particularly in that first third because you, you've got the three different types of of vampires really you've got one that absolutely embraces the thrill and the 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 sumptuousness of being a vampire just like live how you want to live live forever eat who you want to eat you know live a very grand sexual lovely life and then you've got this kind of remorseful vampire that wants to be good and wants to try and mix in with human beings and and struggles with guilt and then you've got yeah like this this abomination like what happens if you're a child and you have to stay in that body forever. So on the inside, she's growing up, but she's stuck in this prepubescent body, right? And it's mm. like, it's a really interesting exploration. I kind of wish there was more of that. And that's just one section of the film that probably lasts about half an hour, right? But it's like, that is, like we both said, it's some of the most interesting stuff of the film, I think. Definitely, you know? yeah. They, yeah. With both of those things, though, um, it does kind of, so with Louis being this, um, you know, he's sort of trying so desperately to be good. Mm. Um, and with with um, Claudia being stuck in this child's body, it does revisit it really not, in like quite a clever little scene later where she brings home the woman who want, like she wants as her companion. Yes. And she has to get Louis to turn her because she literally doesn't have the strength in this child's body to turn. So she'll mm. never be able to sire another no. vampire. I mean, she won't be able to because she's dust in about three scenes time. But um, (laughs) yeah, but yeah. But at that point, so she has to get Louis to do it. And then he says to her, um, we're even because actually what died in that room was the last um, vestige of like my humanity. And Mm. so that is at the point that he has kind of he's over it now right? he's like (laughs) fuck it. I'm never I'm never coming back from this. So that's sort of when he. Um, steps up I think to mm-hmm. more to that like Lestat level where mm-hmm. he's then just going around and eating anybody slashing people up with scythes yes. um, you know. <laughs> yeah. that's shot with the scythe oh um, the scythe is such a strong choice I've got so much respect for that yes because of course yeah he has this again this kind of guilt wrapped up with his relationship with Claudia doesn't he because you know again like him and Tom Cruise literally birthed her together didn't they because mm-hmm. he Brad Pitt in a moment of desperation and hunger eats her because she's there and she's helpless and her mother's dead in the plague and everything and then it's and then it's Lestat that feeds her his blood and brings her back right so it's literally the two of them together make yeah. this, make this child um it's so funny so he kind of has to live with that guilt uh you know and and look after her throughout but yeah it's it, it's i mean she's just great isn't oh, she she's, she's so, so good. good i mean you can you know, you can see why she has gone on to have such an incredible career because yeah. um, even though, I mean, there are a couple of moments where she's um, she's in a real sort of fit of histrionics that she fluffs a couple of lines, yes. but she's extremely young and it's very easy to forgive because when she's good in this movie, she is exceptional. And yeah. you can see like the seeds really of her phenomenal career right there she's so good isn't she and i remember hearing about how you know however old she was she went along to the premiere and then she wasn't actually allowed into the film to watch it because she wasn't old enough to watch it at the (laughs) time which is hilarious but um i'm so glad that she still smashed it she was so great in the power of the dog earlier this year so good and and of course jesse plemons as well also in it and those two are just everyone's favorite couple yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so good. Um, so then we get that moment in midway through the film. That's, that's, you know, it could be like a climax at the end of a film almost, but that big showdown with Lestat and they burn him and everything. And that's kind of it. That's sort of it for act one, right? And then we move on to the second half where 
he meets Antonia Banderas and Stephen Ray's character and, and all of that stuff going on with that kind of traveling theater troupe and everything. So we've already said sort of it's it it doesn't quite reach the heights of the first half. But what do you think of Antonio Banderas generally as an actor and, and a performer? Oh, as an actor, I think he's very good. I've seen him in some brilliant stuff. He's not very good in this. He's um, always at his best when he's Spanish, I think. Oh, like, one thousand percent yeah and in this it just sounds like he's got a mouth full of marbles the whole time and i literally can't understand him <laughs> and like now and again you'll catch a snatch of like yeah snatch something that he said and i'm like yeah i think i know what you're on about and he's very sort of double crossing <laughs> and i uh, like i think um i don't know like i don't think it's his strongest role and uh, like he looks again, he looks incredible. He's got the you know this beautiful, glossy sort of mane of black hair. Like mm. he's you know he's the goth's dream vampire basically. He's got these you know this beautiful huge sort of red robe, quite like um, reminiscent of um, Gary Oldman in um, the Francis Ford Coppola Dracula. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so, I mean, you know, he's Antonio Banderas. I'm not going to like slag him off. He's fine, but he's not. Mm. He's not super good in this, really. What exactly is it that happens that they they sort of have an almost like code, like a vampire code, right? Because d- isn't it when they find out that Claudia and Louis murdered Lestat that they then decide that they have to punish them both? Basically, it's like it's like a fucked up double whammy. So because some of them, and this is. Mm-hmm, like planted the seed earlier some vampires can read minds and so they read um louis and claudia's minds and learn that they've killed lestat Mm -hmm. and also they like basically claudia is kind of in danger from like the moment that they set eye on her because she like that you're not supposed to do that to Mm. kids and i think louis says like well that's not her fault like you know deal with the person who made her Mm. and they sort of say you know she's like I think she's just freaking everybody out. They don't. <laughs> they're yeah. just like what? Little weirdo. Yeah. yeah ew. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, they take very poorly to to this like new duo, and so then you get this push and pull because you've got. So basically, it's a bit like the Grand Guignol, right? They're yes. sort of doing this avant garde. There's this amazing line. Louis says something like. Um, vampires pretending to be humans pretending to be vampires yeah. and she just goes how avant-garde yeah <laughs> so good i love it i know it's great and again like that stuff is really fun and interesting i almost oh. wish there was a bit more of that stuff like the theatrics and there everything. should be so much more of that and there's yeah. some incredible imagery when like uh, so they've they sort of thought really carefully about the stage production of this show that they're putting on. So somebody has their throat slashed, throat slashed and all of these sort of red ribbons get sort of thrown mm. out across the stage. Um, and there's this amazing, there's this amazing shot where they've, so they actually kill a woman on stage. Obviously it's all meant to be part of the act, mm-hmm. but they kill this woman on stage and they all sort of flock onto her like a flock mm. of like bats or crows in this shot from above where they just all like pounce and devour her. Yeah. And what I love so much about it is I half expect the crowd to think that it's all an act and be sort of quiet and watching and then burst into thunderous applause yeah but actually they all just file out silent and yeah. sort of and sort of <laughs> weeping and traumatized about what they've just witnessed and i think that's such a cool choice like i love that they're just like oh my god <laughs> what the fuck it's brilliant that? and it's a great way to live right i i, I recently had to write this um essay for a dvd release for this film called vampire circus which is a a, a hammer horror film and about the kind of um connection almost between vampirism and uh, being part of a kind of carnival troupe or theatrical troupe and and the way in which both of these worlds have been um so popular in horror since the birth of horror basically and both of them kind of tap into the idea that you sort of live on the fringes of society like you you have a kind of surrogate family who you're loyal to you do what you want to do you go where you want to go people think of you as a quote-unquote freak but you you live by your own code 
and you have this kind of freedom and liberation that most of the world don't have. And like, there's something really interesting in connection. It's absolutely between, fascinating. Yeah, yeah, and there is. There's something really um, seductive and alluring, as well as quite scary, about both. And this is something Jamie said too when we talked about the Lost Boys about you know fairgrounds, carnivals, theatrical shows, that kind of thing, alongside vampires. And you see the two crossover quite a lot in films, yeah. which is really interesting. You know, because there's yeah. that performativity, I think, as well. You know? Yeah, definitely. And it's it really. And I agree with you that it would have been nice to have seen more of that. You get these sorts of glimpses of them being a theatre troupe. And what I would have liked was, would have been like, when you then go under the theatre and Mm. you see them as a community down there to kind of see some of that... Um, sort of duplicated down there, like, you know, how how their characters are kind of played when they're yes. not on the stage. Exactly. But actually, it's so focused on Antonio Banderas um, and Louis kind of whispering at each other seductively in dark rooms <laughs> um, that you just don't get any of that. And I think that would have really lent some energy to this second half of the film. Yeah, I 100% agree. But then there is this amazing se- like se- uh, set piece that I always loved and always found really scary, which is where they punish Claudia. So and good. <gasps> it's good, right? It's suddenly like this, it's like this burst of energy after mm-hmm. it's been in quite a dip for quite a long time, right? And suddenly you're just like, what the fuck? Like this terrifying loud sequence where this like, it's like an angry mob of vampires basically, isn't it? Um punish them all obviously like you said by that point claudia's got this kind of mother figure as well and that thing where they kind of just like leave them in that pit for the sun to come up oh and, my you know, goodness it's terrifying isn't well it, it is brilliant. terrifying and it's terrifying because those two actresses are so good at, at, like the way they are huddled against the wall the way they have they really sell that obviously um immediate connection or this bond that they've they've created the way that the the even though claudia is so much older so yeah. much older yes and yeah. actually it's the mum who's the actually it's like the woman who is the newborn yeah um, that's so true yeah and yet she really immediately takes on that kind of um safeguarding role and is trying to cover her in a dress and Mm -hmm. you know they they are just so terrified and kind of trying to get as far up to the wall as they possibly can away from this sunlight which is just like the inevitability of that shot as Mm -hmm. it as the sun moves across the sky and it comes more and more towards and then again you just hear the screams and then when Mm -hmm. louis comes in and they're like like just like little people shaped ash piles Oh, it's good, isn't it? It's good. So good. It's good. Yeah, really love that moment. It's genuinely scary and moving, right? You you suddenly feel like, feel for this Claudia, this like creepy little weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh shit, this poor kid. I know, yeah. awful. Like she's had a fucking awful life. When she was a human, mm. her mum died in front of her because of the plague. Yeah. Then she was basically attacked by a vampire mm-hmm. but didn't actually die then she got turned into a child vampire mm-hmm. and has had to be trapped inside this kid's body while she mm-hmm. ages and yes. then she finally finally like finds herself a companion who um you know is is she sort of looks it looks like she's happy to spend you know the rest of her days with and they literally get to spend about 35 minutes together and then they are both just burst into flames I know. sad times so poor louis is left by himself again and and then this is a kind of big section that's sort of glossed over isn't it but essentially louis sort of wanders by himself doesn't he really i i, I was thinking because obviously last week i talked about Buffy and Angel and I wonder how much the character of Angel is sort of influenced by Mm. Louis as a character that idea of when yeah and that idea of when Angel gets his soul and he just spends like a whole century in America by himself essentially I mean it seems so much like what we see here with Brad Pitt Mm. doesn't it I think definitely and this whole thing about him like eating rats I think when Whistler first finds um, Angel he's like living in a sort of down an alley eating rats, right? Exactly. exactly. There's that uh, there's that really cute bit with Claudia in this film where she's like, rats, you know, yeah. it's like, it was a very long time ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah so really yeah, I think, I, yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah. Um, 
yeah i mean it's got to be a it's got to be a huge huge influence mm. um luckily there aren't any there's there's a few slightly dodgy accents but no dodgy irish nothing, accents nothing as bad as nothing as bad as david Boreanis. it's true um and then yeah we get like one little moment with lestat don't we we get almost like a little closure moment with lestat towards yeah, the end, yeah before and before it ends which is a good moment yeah it's a really good moment and you really like he's just sort of turned into this recluse mm. and he's he's scared when Louis sort of goes to move towards him and he's scared of the helicopter light and stuff like that. Um, and actually, I'm really pleased that that isn't the last time that we see Lestat because I'd have yeah. been really disappointed if you if he did sort of end on this really sort of vulnerable, pitiful down note. Um, but obviously we do get to see him again. Oh, yeah, um, of course. But before that, I just want to call out the cinema bit because I love it when Louis goes to the cinema. I love that too. I was going to say that. And I, this is something I kind of love about this film. And I love any film that, you know, like Forrest Gump does, where like it takes you through eras of history and yeah. one character experiencing it. I kind of love watching that happen, you know? It's always really fun. And yeah, the moment when cinema is invented. Oh, that's my really God. Cool. It's really cool. Yeah. I love that they use Nosferatu. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, this whole thing, because actually there's a, there's a really, really cool moment earlier when they're on the ship and he says some the voiceover says something like, I wanted the waters to be blue, but everywhere we went, they were black. Mm. And this idea, again, of actually being a vampire is a little bit shit. <laughs> You can see why they're all a bit broody and gone. Yeah, you can. You You absolutely can. Like, poor Sod just wants, like, you know, a bit of kind of Mediterranean azure or something. And it's like everywhere he goes, it's just black. Black, Um, yeah. And so he talks about, um, you know, he sees the sunrise for the first time and then it's it's gone with the wind. And then he says, um, and my, what did he, like, something like, my beloved blue or something and then yeah. Superman like flies across so in his cool. suit. It's such a cool moment. It's really good, isn't it? And then we have that great ending, don't we? Like the the interview ends. Christian Slater's all a bit oh, a bit, you know, perturbed by the whole thing and he's driving away and we get that amazing little ending with Lestat coming back as well. So good, right? It's a really fun ending. It's a really fun ending and I really love that Christian Slater has just completely missed the point of the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. He's like, yeah, but make me a vampire. And yeah. Louis is just like, like epic eye roll. Like, oh, for fuck's sake. Yeah. Okay, should I start again from the beginning? <laughs> it's so, uh, yeah, you're right. That's a really good moment as well. Because again, it kind of really encapsulates this phenomenon of the vampire, right? That there is something really cool and alluring about it even though actually as we've seen for the last two hours it's pretty fucking awful to be right exactly and (laughs) still christian slate is like so cool like shall i just you're gonna shall i here's my neck um so it's good by the end of the film because like he kind of probably gets what he wants because the stats gonna you know chow down he loves a good looking male companion Lestat. yes he so does I'm sure you know that'll happen next right i love it <laughs> and we get a bit of sympathy for the devil playing at the end as he drives off as well perfect what a treat it's great <laughs> really fun really fun and that's the thing like it's one of those films that uh, for me, it doesn't quite hang together as a whole, mm-hmm. but it has sections and set pieces of brilliance. And I always remember in my head specific segments that I really love. 100%, and then when I revisit yeah. it, there's chunks of it, large chunks that I forget as well. But like it, it just has some amazing moments, doesn't it? I think it really does. Yeah, you're. I couldn't agree more. Um, it doesn't completely hang together as a whole, and. I think it's quite easy to pinpoint the bits that don't work as well. Mm. But there is enough for me sprinkled through of really on the money moments that just really work so well um, and are so iconic that I will still sit through the slightly boring bits to get to the next good bit <laughs> it's true and there are some there's some great writing i mean like even hearing you quote some of the lines from this film you know like Anne rice's writing is funny it's good it's interesting it's funny it's moving yeah. you know so that really works and the film was like a massive success as we've talked about it was i think it had a 60 million budget 
which is big for a vampire film, and it made two hundred and twenty-five million dollars. Um, so it was like a huge smash. Um, so finally, I guess I just want to ask, like, what what do you, I guess we've sort of touched upon this already, but do you see this movie's kind of legacy in in kind of what has come after it in terms of vampire movies and that kind of thing? I think so. I think, uh, as we said at the beginning, the the main thing it really kicked off and as and lends to vampire films even today is this this heartthrob vampire um you know the and also i think that vampires can be played by massive stars or that massive stars can be involved in vampire movies and yeah. i think it really kind of kicked that off or, or at least you know if the lost boys kicked it off interview with the vampire really solidified it definitely or definitely. sort of took it to the next level um so yeah i mean i i would say i would say that you probably wouldn't have twilight if it wasn't for interview with the vampire Agreed. i would go that i Agreed. would go that far i almost wonder i don't know but i almost wonder if you wouldn't have had buffy the vampire slayer the tv show you know in 1997 yeah, maybe. i yeah. don't know but i'm sure it contributed to so much of what we got afterwards any kind of tragic brooding romantic <laughs> handsome vampire right it feels like this is the one this is the one that kind of kicked it all off you know so we've got a lot to thank it for really yeah i mean either way it's got a lot to answer for I think, this movie. <laughs> <laughs> um all right well we we need to move on and talk about another vampire film in just a moment but first of all let's head on over to this week's wild about horror segment because mary wild as you can imagine has got plenty to say on Interview with the Vampire. Hey Mike, Mary Wilde calling. This time with some thoughts on Interview with the Vampire, Neil Jordan's American Gothic horror film based on Anne Rice's novel of the same name. It focuses on Lestat and Louis, chronicling their time together. The narrative is framed by a present-day interview in which Louis tells his story to a San Francisco reporter. Louis describes his human life as a wealthy plantation owner in 1791 Spanish Louisiana. Despondent following the death of his wife and unborn child, he drunkenly wanders the waterfront of New Orleans one night and is attacked by the vampire Lestat. Lestat senses Louis' dissatisfaction with life and offers to turn him into a vampire. Louis accepts but quickly comes to regret it. While Lestat revels in the hunt and killing of humans, Louis resists his instinct to kill opting instead to drink animal blood to sustain himself. Firstly, I want to comment on the structure of Interview with the Vampire. As a film, it is organized much like the clinical psychotherapy setting, with Louis opening up and sharing details of his personal experiences. The reporter asks questions and Louis responds. His answers are emotionally honest and eagerly documented. This soul-bearing process places us in the mindset of forensically examining what is essentially a life of crime, undead creatures crossing national borders and centuries, never quite integrating anywhere, but leaving piles of bodies in their wake. Louis' account is a confession, an attempt to unburden his conscience because he loathes the impulses that have been imposed upon him. He feels ashamed of the urges that define a vampire's existence, the tingling, unmistakable sense of temptation at the mere sight of exposed human veins, the thrilling rush of sinking, pointed teeth in delicate, vulnerable flesh, the euphoria of transferring hot blood into a cold body. It would be remiss of me as a psychoanalyst not to mention the close link between the ingestion impulse in vampirism and the oral stage of psychosexual development. In Sigmund Freud's theory, the oral stage spans from birth until the age of one year, wherein the infant's mouth is the focus of libidinal gratification derived from the pleasure of feeding at the mother's breast 
and from the oral exploration of their environment, that is to say, the tendency to place objects in the mouth. The id dominates the oral stage because the superego has not developed and the infant has yet to establish an identity. In this phase, every action is based upon the pleasure principle, the driving force that seeks immediate gratification of our most basic and primitive needs, wants, and urges. Within the logic of the vampire world, we can interpret Lestat's enthusiasm for human blood as a positive acceptance of his condition. Lestat leans into the breast, as it were, fully committing to the oral dimension of vampirism. He eagerly and lovingly surrenders to the pleasures of operating in accordance with oral whims. This is what makes Lestat such a force of nature in the film. He is joyous, animated, dynamic, and deliciously watchable as a one-man vampire festival. Lestat is sexy and fun. Louis, however, cannot escape the ethical conflict of his reality. How can he allow himself to delight in the taste of human blood when innocent lives get destroyed in the process? Louis's failure to meet the oral demands of his situation creates an obsessionally neurotic disposition in him, resulting in libidinal energy becoming dammed up and pathological character traits taking hold. The superego is strong in Louis. He ruminates on his impulses, which seem overwhelming to him, but he nevertheless strives to gain control and mastery over them. Louis's refusal on moral grounds to kill humans and the relentless pressure to resist powerful, violent urges combine to shape a deeply closeted personality. He is inhibited, hesitating to act, fearfully avoiding his own nature and delaying the inevitable. He diligently tries to cope with bouts of anxiety and sadness, becoming an iconic representation of the vampire as a depressive figure. My final point about interview with the vampire, and perhaps the most important interpretation I have to offer, is that the relationship between Lestat and Claudia resembles Munchausen syndrome by proxy, also called factitious disorder imposed on another. This is a condition in which a mother or father creates the appearance of health problems in their child. This may include the caregiver injuring the child or presenting the child as being sick or incapacitated. Permanent harm or death of the victim may occur as a result of Munchausen by proxy. It is perhaps the most lethal form of abuse. If we recall in the film, amid an outbreak of plague in New Orleans, Louis succumbs to temptation in a rare moment of weakness and feeds on a little human girl whose mother died in the plague. To entice Louis to stay with him, Lestat turns the dying girl, Claudia, into a vampire. Together, they raise her as a daughter. Louis has fatherly love for Claudia, while Lestat spoils and treats her more as a pupil, training her to become a merciless killer. Thirty years pass, and Claudia matures psychologically, but remains a little girl in appearance and continues to be treated as such by Lestat. When she realizes that she will never grow older or become a mature woman, she is furious with Lestat and tells Louis that they should leave him. In Munchausen by Proxy, a caregiver makes a dependent person appear mentally or physically ill in order to gain attention. To perpetuate the medical relationship, the caregiver purposely harms the dependent by poisoning, suffocating, infecting, or physically injuring them. Aside from the motive of gaining attention or sympathy, another feature that differentiates Munchausen by proxy from typical physical child abuse is the degree of premeditation involved. 
whereas most physical abuse entails lashing out at a child in response to some behavior, such as crying or spilling food, assaults on the Munchausen victim are unprovoked and planned. The perpetrator continues the abuse because maintaining the child in the role of patient satisfies the abuser's needs. The cure for the victim is to separate the child completely from the abuser. Key features of Munchausen by proxy include a highly attentive parent who is reluctant to leave their child's side, a parent with symptoms similar to their child's own medical problems, an emotionally distant relationship between the two parents, a parent who seems to have an insatiable need for attention and adulation, a child that is overly articulate regarding medical terminology and their own disease process for their age, and the abusive parent seeming comfortable and not upset over harm done to the child. Taking the Munchausen by proxy definition into account, my perception is that Lestat had to come up with a plan to sustain Louis's attention in order to preserve Louis as a constant companion and prevent him from abandoning their arrangement. In order to achieve this, Lestat takes advantage of Louis's moment of weakness following his attack on Claudia. By turning the child into a vampire, Lestat ensures Louis's presence in their lives, as she can slot right into the void of his unborn human child, inviting Louis to project his hopes and dreams onto Claudia, giving him a reason to stay in their strange family. Claudia's physical development into a woman is suspended, having been changed into a vampire during childhood. She is now forever small and stunted in appearance, with a sophisticated understanding of her illness, but unable to change her position of fragility. The communicable disease of vampirism cements Claudia in the permanent role of dependent patient, which satisfies Lestat's need for Louis's commitment. Without a shred of remorse over the harm he has caused, Lestat makes Claudia sick inside the toxic parameters of the Munchausen system, infantilizing her to secure Louis's undivided attention. Lestat's plan works, at least for a while. Until next time. A big thank you to the wonderful Mary Wilde. Uh, and don't forget, if you want to hear more of Mary's takes on genre films and any other topics, you can subscribe to her Patreon channel. Just head on over to patreon.com forward slash Mary Wilde. Okay, Becky, um, we're going to go on to another mid-90s vampire movie now that could not be more different tonally <laughs> to Interview with the Vampire. Uh, this is From Dusk Till Dawn from 1996. Somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Low profile. You understand the meaning of the words low profile? Sure. Two of America's most dangerous criminals have taken hostages. What is this? It's called a punch. I'm gonna ask you one question, and all I want is a yes or no answer. Do you want to live through this? Yes. Okay, ramblers, let's get rambling. One night is all that stands between them and freedom. This is my kind of place. But it's going to be one hell of a night so as you've already said this is written by quentin tarantino and directed by robert rodriguez um becky what tell us the batshit story for for from dust till dawn i don't know what you're talking about it's extremely simple um got seth and richie gecko 
They are career criminals. Um, Seth is a professional thief and Richie is a bank robber and rapist. (laughs) And they've just broken out from prison um, and robbed a bank and kidnapped a bank teller. Mm. And what they need to do is get their money from America to Mexico, where they will be safe from the feds. Mm -hmm. And they've got like sanctuary waiting for them there. Yeah. That's quite a difficult journey because, mm-hmm. you know, the police are on their tail. When they robbed the bank and broke out of prison and stuff, they've got this massive body count. They've killed a load of cops and um, pu- like not park rangers. No, I don't think I meant park rangers, Texas rangers or something. Um, and yeah, there's, there's one Texas ranger played by John Saxon who's like, it's personal. We Uh-oh. want them. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> plus, because Richie is absolutely fucking unhinged and psychotic and apparently can't stop raping and killing people, um, they also lose the bank teller quite early on and mm. then have to sort of like, like flee the scene from that. Yeah. And the way they flee the scene is there's a family played by... Um, uh, Harvey Keitel is the dad and his two kids and they are <laughs> out in their like rambler kind of Winnebago thing yep. and they pull up in this um, motel and they are essentially kidnapped by the Gecko brothers to take them over the border to Mexico. Mm. Simple as that. Simple, simple. It's just get across the border from one from one country to the other, basically, isn't it? Exactly. Yep. And the rendezvous is a bar called the Titty Twister and it turns out the the titty twister is built on top of an ancient Mexican <laughs> pyramid and has been feet and the vampires that live there have been feasting. Yeah, by the on, way, there are vampires. There are, oh, yeah. Sorry. Did I mention that? There are vampires. Didn't they mention that at the beginning of the film? Weirdly, they didn't. No. I assume they mentioned that earlier, so I, I wasn't going to bring it up. Weird. <laughs> So, so all of the vampires that live in this bar that's built on top of an ancient Mexican pyramid mm-hmm. have been feasting on all of the truckers and bikers who have been coming to this bar over the years, living their lovely little lives, minding their own business. They don't, you know. And then the Gecko brothers turn up and it all goes south. Perfectly put. Perfect. Can I just say, right... This is a film where I feel like at this point, everyone knows that this is a vampire film, okay, right? Thank surely. God. Yeah, but, surely. But I watched this the other day with Rihanna, who had never seen it, and <laughs> it was so good. Her re- I wish to God I had got her reaction on camera because. You are her- kidding me. She didn't know. She didn't know. Her face was agape. <laughs> when suddenly Salma Hayek changed into this monster and she screamed, what the fuck is happening? It was it was so good. I was like, wow. And I was like, why did you think I was watching this film? And she was like, yeah, yeah I did wonder that. <laughs> that I mean, not only, not only am I surprised that somebody didn't know that mm. this was actually a vampire film. I'm quite surprised that Rihanna Dillon, the professional film critic, didn't I know, know. right? Because surely you just come across that fact somewhere. That's what I thought. I that's like, amazing. That, that's amazing that you've never come... Because she, she, she said, oh, you know, it's always been a movie that's been a blind spot for me. I've never seen it. Yeah. And she knew it was this Quentin Tarantino oh sort of crime movie with I George Clooney. envy that. Though. I know. It's because so I... Did you know the first time you saw it? I did. I did know. So did I. Yes. So yes. did I. So yes. I knew. And I, oh my God, I would have loved the experience of that literal, like, what the actual fuck moment. Yeah. Well, I remember all my family telling me. So again, I was too young to go see this at the cinema at the time. But I had two older sisters and I think they went with my dad to see it. Mm. And I remember them all telling me about it the next day and being like that film was fucking mad. We thought it was just like a Tarantino film mm-hmm. and then it became this insane vampire film midway through. And I, she, I remember my family telling me that there were people that were just walking out of the cinema in that second half because, again, you either, you either go to that film knowing what you're in for and embracing it or that second half is going to completely put you off, I suppose. <laughs> it's really funny. But it's a bold choice. It's so bold that they don't even tease that that is a vampire film at the beginning even. Like, you know, 
apart from the fact that the title is From Dust Till Dawn, maybe that is the only thing that gives you a clue. But until sure, then, but, you'd have you know, no idea. There's no clue. There's no, there's no clue. And no. this is around the sort of time that George Clooney was in films like Out of Sight. Yeah. Like, you know, I don't know. There's something like you've got Out of Sight, you've got From Dust Till Dawn. Like, it's a crime caper. Totally. Maybe, well, you know, it could be anything. It could be anything. You look at all the names involved. George Clooney, you know, Harvey Keitel, Quentin Tarantino. These are all people that were associated associated with these much more gritty real crime movies and that's yeah. exactly what you get midway through so you have no idea that what you're in for is this like tom savini b movie in the second half basically it's so funny <laughs> you're gonna tell me that you don't like the vampire half aren't you uh, little, no, not no no that's not true i it's not that's too <laughs> strong i it's not that i dislike it but I have to say, and I know this is really sacrilegious and I'm going to lose my horror credentials for saying this, but I love the first half of it so much mm. that for me, it does lose a little something actually when everything grinds. It's like Interview with a Vampire. Yeah. Midway through, everything grinds to a halt and it just becomes this kind of schlocky shootout. And it's there are moments of it that are brilliant, but I think, again, it loses momentum and it loses a bit of energy uh, I don't know. There's a there's a section of it when they're just barricaded in a back room. When I'm like, I don't know. For for me, it loses something after that initial kind of shock that we're in a vampire movie. You know, I kind sure. of just wish they were because again, and we'll talk about this as we go in a minute. But I really, really love the first half. I love the character dynamics. I love the dialogue. I think Quentin Tarantino's character is fucking terrifying. terrifying. Probably more scary than the vampires, right? Without and, and a doubt. So that for me is the sort of more interesting horror film, I think. Um, I don't know. I, I, is that a really bad thing to say? It's not a bad thing to say. And actually, I think you've hit on a really important point because it is a horror film from the word go. Yes, yeah. It isn't a it isn't a Quentin Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez crime caper that turns into a horror film halfway through. Mm -hmm. It is a Quentin Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez horror film from the word go. Yeah, yeah. And the stuff with like the the gore and the the blood and then the stuff with Richie and the way that so for example oh my god this film is genius yeah. for example when he has killed the teller and Seth comes back to the hotel room and he opens the door oh. and you don't see her mm -hmm. what you see is Seth's reaction yeah and then in all of these split second cuts, yeah. like splices into his face, you see the blood on the bed, the blood on the phone, the blood on the sheets, maybe there's blood on her leg. George Clooney's performance and his face and he just goes, what is wrong with you? That, like that's yeah. all he says initially, right? And it's just, yeah. it's so good. Yeah, yeah, it's so good. And then as he turns, the camera turns with him. And then so as they have the confrontation, then you can full see her body in the back. Mm. I mean, it is it is masterful, masterful filmmaking. This is the thing. And I don't know where that movie would have gone in the second half because they succeed in their mission. They get across the border. So what, what would they have done? I mean, it's almost like the story is complete after that halfway yeah. mark. But... I, w I wanted more of that amazing dynamic, you know, between mm. all of these great characters. Um, but having said that, I still think the film is so much fun from beginning to end. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan. I think it's great. And it, again, like Interview with the Vampire, specific, and this is something Tarantino is very good at, but like set pieces. There are just set pieces of just pure brilliance that are almost like little plays, you know, like that opening sequence in the gas station. Oh you know, my like, God. It's so just good. like they work almost on their own as these amazing little isolated, you know, pieces, don't they? Um, uh, yeah, it's there's so much to discuss. But what do you think of this movie? I take it you're a fan. I, I love From Dusk Till Dawn. Mm -hmm. I've loved it from the first moment I saw it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I put it on again to watch it for this. And I, it was like being home. I don't know how else to describe it. Like, it's just... It's a firm, firm favourite. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you'd even told me you were doing vampires next <laughs> but i had already texted you to say whenever you do vampires yeah. please can i do from dust till dawn yeah 
Yeah, you did. You you were the you were the one that chose both these films that we're talking about, and and uh, you know they work so well as a pairing, even though they're so different. I think, but uh, it's it is it's there are just there are so much about it that is so brilliant. Um, maybe we should start. Let's start off by talking about Quentin Tarantino because I feel like he didn't direct it. But do you know what it feels like to me? It feels like one of those things where. You know, Toby Hooper directed Poltergeist, but it really feels like a Spielberg film, you know, and it, it almost feels like that to me where yeah. Tarantino's sort of fingerprints, I think, are all over this film. From oh, without a end, doubt. You know, of course. Yeah, of course they are. And if somebody told me it was a Quentin Tarantino film, I'd believe them. Yes. And it but basically is, I think. I but think yeah. there's I think there's enough of Robert Rodriguez um, mm-hmm. in it that that makes it still feel his there there are moments in it that could be taken straight from desperado talking talking about antonio banderas that's true yeah you know when when the gas station explodes um the band in the titty twister (laughs) yeah um there's a couple of other moments like some some of the way some of the frames are shot and stuff like Mm. he's much more i always find rodriguez much more um sort of up close and personal yeah like like tarantino's shots are a bit more um composed yeah a bit sort of slightly yeah more rectangular yes and almost kind a, of, almost kind of stagey in a yes. way yeah yeah and you i don't really find that with rodriguez he's much more like the shots for example where you've got um and these are like really iconic shots from this film where you've got uh, Seth pointing the gun. And so the gun will be in the foreground out mm-hmm. of focus. And then you've got Seth beautifully mm-hmm. crisp in focus in the background. Like that is pure Rodriguez for me. Um, it's interesting because for me, that is, that's Reservoir Dogs. That's Tarantino. You oh, know, there, really? are, there are shots in uh. Reservoir Dogs where that is happening. But the two of them, I mean, they're best friends, right? Like, exactly, yeah. Have, have very similar styles. And, of you course, know, yeah. there's a lot of, and I know everyone talks about this all the time with Tarantino, there's a lot of feet in this. Oh. There's a lot of bare feet and that kind of thing, right? I wonder if the reason it turns into a vampire film <laughs> is because Quentin Tarantino, when he was writing it, couldn't find a way of getting Salma Hayek to pour tequila down <laughs> her naked leg and foot into his mouth if it just carried on being a crime caper so he was like okay well how am i how am i gonna get to drink tequila off of (laughs) salma hayek's foot with we're gonna have to go vampires guys this is the only way i can make it work what a way to ruin the sexiest movie moment of all time with salma hayek dancing than to have quentin tarantino's horrible little face looking up at her with (laughs) Like gnawing on her foot. It's so disgusting. <laughs> oh god. Oh, dear. But yeah, he you know, he was at the top of his game at this point, right? And and you know, he had done Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. He had written other movies for other directors like True Romance, Natural Born Killers, and they all shared DNA with this, this this killers on the road, oh, this killers time, on the yeah. run thing. Yeah. I do feel like his fingerprint is all over this. And, you know, whatever you think of Quentin Tarantino, I think he's so good at writing dialogue. And again, like that opening sequence in that gas station, I just think is it's perfectly composed. It's so well staged. It's so well performed. The tension, you know, this long conversation and then the characters are hiding with hostages and then he goes to the bathroom and then they hide again and then it will like you said it ends in that explosion and then walking away from it it's just like it's just chef's kiss i think that opening absolute chef's kiss it could be a short film yeah um and don't you think that quentin tarantino is much much better in this film that he is than he is in a lot of other films his own films yeah in his own films exactly i feel like maybe his best mate robert rodriguez might have um helped him along a bit yeah exactly he's very good at directing quentin tarantino because i mean he's very very good and all of those spine chilling (laughs) yeah quiet quiet moments like when they're in the back of the rv and he's talking to Kate, oh. he's talking to Juliet Lewis, um, and he'll he sort of he's like, we'll, we'll talk later, like oh. that kind of thing, like exactly and when he takes out his little, his, oh. <laughs> he takes out his little retainer. No, 
<laughs> and he's like, I grind my teeth. <laughs> it's so horrible. Yeah, you, yeah, and and again, you know, not to keep comparing it to other Tarantino films, but he feels to me like uh, Mr. Blonde in Reservoir Dogs, like this absolutely just unhinged. unhinged, this person who is terrifying. You don't want to be around because he is. He's he he's a sadist essentially. Like he's yeah, he's a he's sadist. He's not doing he's not doing what he has to do to get away. He's doing it because he enjoys it. Right? He's killing people at every given opportunity and raping women as well. You know, he's he he's well, and not just and not just women. Like like he seems to have this real predilection for young women as well. I know yeah. that the, the the teller isn't um, mm. necessarily, but yeah, I, but but he, I, you're right. Like he does enjoy it, but I for me the thing that makes him even more terrifying is that I don't think he's got any handle on it whatsoever. I just don't think he can control himself. Mm -hmm. He is so unpredictable and um, nihilistic, like sort of that, that reactionary sort of in the moment, just, just, I, like I hate people like that. Like yeah. not that I hang out with a lot of rapists and killers, but you know the sorts of people where they're so unpredictable that it's like it makes you nervous to just be in their presence yeah. because you don't know what's going to happen yes. in the next moment if their mood flips or if yes. something Those sorts of happens that to might, sort of that, set that them that off. Inevitably, will like get into a fight on a night Ugh. out or something. It's like it's like Begbie in Train Spotting, like those types of. It people. is exactly like Begbie in Train Spotting. That's yeah. such a good comparison. Yeah. So I mean, and he's really he's really really good at that oh. because I believe that I wouldn't want to be in a room with Richie Gecko. Yes. Because you're not getting out of it you know and Seth is such a brilliant character too and the two of them have such an amazing dynamic because you you believe it 100% you know this 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 pair of men who have this obviously this brotherly love and they have this love for each other even though actually you know that Seth knows his brother is a monster oh, yeah. right but he, he sort of has this love for him I you also maybe feels like he almost kind of owes him right because I think he he, he got Seth he out, got of him out of prison. Yeah, he got him out of prison. So there's this kind of code that Seth abides by almost, but um, he And knows. do you also think that there's this thing about like Seth almost trying to protect Richie from himself? Yes. Like he's sort of trying to keep him from, from behaving this way mm-hmm. because he knows that Richie's going to end up back in jail or dead mm. or, you know, yeah. as, well, as well as... Because I think I think Seth is the anti-hero of this film. You know, yeah. he's obviously not a nice guy. And as he says, the iconic line at the end, I'm a bastard, but I'm not a fucking bastard. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, so he's not a good guy, but no. he he does give a shit. Like by mm. the end, you know, he, he has got a respectful relationship with Jacob. Like he does the right thing as far as he can by Kate mm-hmm. and you know he's he's obviously genuinely devastated by Richie's death and stuff and I think even though he's you know a terrible person he's not like evil and yeah. I completely sympathize with him which helps because George Clooney as Seth Gecko in <laughs> From Dust Till Dawn is one of the sexiest most like devastatingly hot men that's ever been on screen and I can't yeah. I can't handle it Mike I cannot handle it yeah he's incredible isn't he he's 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 amazing I agree with you he's the most charismatic man and it's one of the most and this is the most charismatic actor in the world and yet somehow it's still one of the most charismatic performances even he has ever given exactly. I think right exactly. it's, it's, it's almost one you know you mentioned out of sight and that's up there too and it's sort of similar out of sight he plays that kind of charismatic criminal but it's like one upped in this isn't it yeah. almost um yeah he's got that tattoo creeping oh, up tattoo. his neck I bet you love that I was gonna say <laughs> Jesus. Becky's losing it now. Sorry. Um, yeah. Back. It, he's amazing. And yes, you know, I think obviously he's not a nice person. He's a horrible person. He's a criminal. He, But he is, y- you do get the feeling that with him, at least you, you, w- you would be safe if you did what he said and you didn't Absolutely. cross him. And he spends a lot of his time, doesn't he, when he talks to people going... Listen to me. If you do what I say, I give you my word, you will get out of this. And he 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 goes out of his way to say that quite a lot. I noticed, like to his hostages or you know whatever. He's trying. But you to believe be him, don't you? Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. You believe that if you do what he says, what he says. And I think that's one of the things that makes him react the way that he does when he comes back and finds the teller dead in the bedroom because he's promised her... Exactly. that, ...that if she plays by the rules, doesn't make any noise then she'll get out of there alive. Mm. And because of what Richie does, Seth has broken his promise to her. And exactly. I think that really annoys him. And really it's upsets so him. true. He, he's a man that abides by a sort of code. Again, yeah. like for me, he's a character straight out of, he's like Samuel L. Jackson in Pulp Fiction, or he's like Harvey Keitel's character in, in Reservoir Dogs. These are criminals. These are bad people, but within their world, they have values, right? And Absolutely. they kind of live by their word. Um, yeah. It, and, it's just they're just such brilliant characters they have amazing chemistry again like that brilliant argument they're having as they walk out of that gas station that's just exploded and they're bickering and yelling at each other and then you see them drive off and you see that kind of interesting kind of x-ray vision shot of the great? hostage in the boot of the car i love it's that. so good isn't it it's just like wow oh what an opening what a, <laughs> what a sequence and yeah love it love everything to do with these two guys like you said i think it's tarantino's best best performance as well um and then you and then we get harvey Keitel playing a such a different character as well i think to what we're used yeah. to right this very kind of quite nervous wholesome preacher yeah. man as well i mean really interesting in being introduced to him like it was what's the one oh my god what's that film where he's the degenerate cop is it violent cop oh a bad lieutenant bad lieutenant yeah but mate if you've seen bad lieutenant mm-hmm. and then you've seen this mm-hmm. those are two very different characters and very different performances right. like Bad Lieutenant fucked me up and really showed me quite how dark Harvey Keitel is is able to go in his performances. Yes. And you're right in this. He's relatively fluffy. Yeah, he, um, is. he is. And he's got this lovely relationship with his kids. Um, yeah. You know, and th- there's a really nice, when you're first introduced to them and they're in the diner, it's a really nice sort of like playfulness between mm-hmm. the way that they all interact as a family um but then also as the film goes on you like so he's lost he hasn't lost his faith but he's lost his love mm. for god right so he still believes in god and he still believes in genus jesus which is important yes. later yes because he's still technically like a religious man because he hasn't lost his faith um and you really you get to learn so much more about him as the film goes on like he's not an absolute prude like he does drink he's just not drinking right now Mm -hmm. um he is quite able to you know smack somebody around the head with a pool cue if he needs to um he's extremely confident around protecting his children like you know he's very brave and like he's not a pushover by any stretch of the imagination Mm -hmm. i love the character of jacob i think he's amazing so good all of these characters are brilliant um and again especially brilliant in relation to the gecko brothers i think as well because there's, there's these these two families both of them love each other and are completely 100% loyal to each other, but they're on opposite sides of the kind of, you know, the spectrum in some ways as well, right? All lumped together. But yeah, love love him in this. I think he's really interesting to see him play that kind of different role. And then we've got Ernest Liu as his son, Scott, who's great. And then, of course, Juliette Lewis. Oh, my God. We've talked about Yellow Jackets together, right? But Mm. how, I mean, I, I just love her. She's brilliant, isn't she? And this was kind of peak Juliette Lewis era, wasn't it, this time? Early 90s. Yeah. Um, yeah. And importantly, she she looks very. They've they've sort of made her up to look very young, and that is important because you need that to really instill the dread of Richie yes. um, in all of their interactions. Um, but because she's Juliet Lewis, by the end of the film, where she is talking smack and kicking ass <laughs> yeah. you like you believe it right yeah. it's like yeah i completely believe that this um this this girl because i think she's 20 right because mm-hmm. when she goes to drink the whiskey she says like i'm not 21 yet that's right yeah, yeah um yeah. but they style her very very cleverly mm. to really make that threat from richie at its absolute worst it's 
this is what's really gross about the film. And I'm not necessarily saying this is a bad thing because it's all deliberate, but this is an extremely sleazy film, right? Yes. And And the way... How do you feel about it? Again, watching it now, you know, the way in which Juliette Lewis is portrayed and shot through this camera lens, right? There are so many shots of her half naked, camera going up and down her body, sitting on the toilet with her knickers around her knees, like... And I know it's all deliberate and it's part of this threat, right? But but what what do you think of the way this movie looks in terms of its kind of sleaziness and its male gaze? It's I mean it's it's a male gaze, but it's it's Richie's gaze. The thing that makes me hesitate so much is that, you know, this is a Weinstein's film. Yeah. And what what I wish I was able to do is to look at it more simply through, well, it's it's through Richie's eyes mm-hmm. or it's through the border guard's eyes or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's, it's so hard. And like another one of these things where it's like this fucking bloke has... Um, has sort of poisoned part of my interaction with this movie that I love so much because you know now I look at it and I'm like I can't read this in a completely pure and straightforward filmmaking way yeah yeah there's always this bit at the back of my head scratching going ew I know you know it is what it is and I think as we have said so many times before um both on and off mic um you just have to kind of view it knowing that and yeah. like don't you know don't ignore it acknowledge it um read up about it if you can um mm-hmm. and i think i think in this it i do i do genuinely believe i genuinely believe that that camera is richie's point of view yes um but like I say, there's that little scratch at the back of my head that just makes me hope that that's true. <laughs> I know, I know. And I think you're and right, also, though. I think you're right. Like, it's, it's, it is deliberately deeply uncomfortable. I oh, think. yeah. You know, oh, it's, yeah. it's always. And it's, and it's like, it's acknowledged in the script. You know, like, Seth is acknowledging it constantly. Mm-hmm. He says at one point to um, Jacob something like, um, did you see the way he was looking at your daughter? And he's like, yes, I did. Yes. It's like, okay, well we need to work together to make sure that he doesn't do anything to her that like or something like that exactly, so it's exactly. it's not even necessarily that it's leaving it to the audience to decide that that is um the 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 viewpoint of Richie like mm-hmm. i think you know it it really is kind of um overtly raised um yeah so yeah, i don't know i agree and i think yeah that there, there is something i can only speak for myself but i i never found i always found those shots of juliette lewis even as a teenage boy more kind of frightening and uncomfortable right. than they were sexy right even i don't before think i, I don't knew think what was going on behind the scenes with certain people or whatever you know um, i completely agree i don't think um a lot of people are going to look at that and sort of think for you no. know you're looking at that going oh Shit. God, yeah because like, like yeah. you say they've it looks like they've aged her down. They've made her mm-hmm. look younger and more vulnerable, right? And it's very different to, for example, to Salma Hayek, which is genuinely one of the sexiest moments in cinema. Uh, so it's like, that's they're two very different things, aren't they? That's the thing. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I had to look up Salma Hayek as well um, before <laughs> I knew we were going to talk about her and because she's, she's famously spoken out about Harvey Weinstein. Yes, she has. Um, not in relation to this film. And again, I'm looking at her standing around in the skimpiest outfit Mm -hmm. and with the hottest body that has ever existed, Mm -hmm. thinking, oh God, darling, I hope hope you're okay. Um, Now, you know, when when she came out to speak about Harvey Weinstein, it was um, about his involvement in Frida. Um, Yes, that's right, yeah. And so she, she was older at that point. It wasn't at the time that she was making this film. It was slightly later in her career. And um, he was, I think she referred to him something as like, he was my own kind of monster. Now she mm. managed to, as far as her story goes, you know, she managed to get away without um, 
being sexually assaulted, but only like by a really slim margin. And he was just a hideous, hideous bully to her. Yes. Um, but you know, I think at this point, um, it was very early on that in her in their um, uh, like relationship, I don't think she knew him very well, and she was really there because. Um, uh, she was friends with Robert Rodriguez. Yes, and, she would and have been in Desperado, Tarantino. right? At yeah, that exactly. point. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's. I mean, obviously it's important to know all of that stuff watching it, but I think even, you know, we both saw this film back in the day and I think mm-hmm. even before you know all that stuff, there is still a lot of deeply sleazy, uncomfortable elements about this movie, but that for me feels deliberate, right? It's all part of the text of Agreed. this movie. And also, you know, regardless of the in-world stuff, also I think we realise this when we get to the second half particularly, that this whole film feels like a kind of homage to sleazy 70s sort of exploitation movies, right? It's like... Right. As so much of their work is, you know, throughout both of exactly. um, Tarantino's and, and Rodriguez is sort of oeuvre. Exactly, yeah. I mean, like, even the casting of Tom Savini doesn't feel accidental, <laughs> right? Um, you know, it, it's clearly we're in, like, an homage to that stuff in the second half. <laughs> I love Tom Savini in this film so yeah, much. Yeah, Sex Machine, amazing. Sex Machine. And it's great because you get to know him for so long first Mm -hmm. and then he just introduces himself and he's like um what's your name and she says kate and he goes sex machine nice to meet you (laughs) so should we should we talk about the second half of this film then uh sure we get to the titty twister also hilariously sleazy the pussy we got smelly pussy we that guy (laughs) that guy pie pussy it's so gross (laughs) <laughs> but hilarious, right? But so, hilarious. And also he does get the shit kicked out of him. He so. really does. He really does. Um, love this whole sequence. Love the band that are playing, right? I mean, and again, this is... Again, Rodriguez, Tarantino, they're so similar anyway, but this feels very Tarantino to me. This It really takes its time. It just lets you like sit in the world of this bar, soaking up the atmosphere for so long before anything actually happens, right? Yeah. You're just there enjoying a night out with them for quite a big chunk of this sequence, you know? Yeah. And then we get this kind of sexy uh, table dance followed by the vampire reveal, right? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> What's her name? Santanico Pandemonium. (laughs) And what is it? There's a moment, first of all, where there's a fight. There's a bar brawl, right? Because Seth got angry with somebody. So because they beat up the pussy guy on the way in. Yes, that's right. After she finishes her dance and Seth's like, that's what I call a fucking show. Then he looks over Richie's shoulders and the guys from outside are like coming in Mm. and they're like, it's that guy. Mm. And then the fight breaks out and because Richie has the gun shot through his hand someone that he's got it on the table and somebody puts a knife through the gunshot <laughs> in his hand which again feels like a very sort of Tarantino yeah. moment he's always got gun shots in people yes um and then she basically gets like like it starts salivating at the blood that's and that's right. when she turns so good so good so what do you think of these vampires like we've we've talked about throughout this series a lot about the different kind of portrayals of vampires this is not the kind of beautiful frilly cuff vampires that we've just seen in interview <laughs> with the vampire in this one right it is not <laughs> um i really like that there's all sorts of different types of vampires yes so She's sort of a serpent, right? Because yeah. she's got she's got the big snake around her anyway. She's got like the Britney Spears banana banana snake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then when she turns into a vampire, she is like a big yeah. snake. Yeah, it's like something out of Harry Potter or something. Yeah, it's like a snake person. Yeah. <laughs> and then, but then you've got them where they've got a face that looks a bit like a bat, bat's face. Um, some their eyes go sort of white, but. And like there's a lot of teeth, you know, yeah. just lots of pointy teeth. Yep. Some their foreheads go like in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I c- and like some of it's kind of looks really practical effects. Some of it looks really like CGI, I yeah. think. But but there is a, re- a lot of really great practical effects work in this. So um, and I yeah. suppose you'd fucking have to if you've got Tom Savini on set. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I actually really like the kind of um, the smorgasbord of vampire styles we're, we're served up. Yeah, I love it too. And that initial reveal 
it's so like, what the fuck is happening? And that whole sequence is brilliant. It's just carnage. It just explodes, doesn't it? Exactly, absolutely explodes. And suddenly it becomes a film that is no longer about the story. It is pure spectacle, right? We are watching it to watch heads get lopped off and eyes to get gouged out. And there's, like you said, it... There are some incredible moments of makeup effects and CGI and all of that kind of thing Mm. right in this sequence. And particularly the practical effects, I think, still look so good. And actually, you say about the the set piece being all about spectacle. What it reminds me of is the... um, the fight scene in Kill Bill where it goes black and white. Like, and again, it's just like in that, it's all of the... um, the assassins yes. and in this it's just all of the vampires and like sort of one or a small band of people up against what seems like just this never ending <laughs> wave of <laughs> foes with limbs and heads and blood and furniture and <laughs> who knows what just like flying all over and all of a sudden the band are playing a, a torso uh, where did they get that <laughs> from did they have that stashed at the back of they fashioned it really quickly out of something so good isn't it now do you think does this bar every night close its doors and eat its customers or yeah. was this a freak occurrence because that fight broke out do you think like uh, i actually i said yes very quickly i think it's somewhere in the middle mm. i think the vampires now and again might just have like a bit, a of, bit a of downtime night. yeah a bit of downtime <laughs> actually i'm not that hungry yeah yep. <laughs> our back room is already full of stash from all of these trucks and stuff <laughs> kind of don't need any more ghetto blasters or whatever yeah um so but I do think that now and again, it'll be like, well, we're getting low on ghetto blasters and blood. So shall we kill all of the customers? <laughs> and I think I think that this is definitely um, a sort of freak occurrence where, although saying that there must be fights breaking out in there all the time. So are you honestly telling me that every time, like, like as soon as somebody bleeds, surely she's going to go snaky go and crazy. go mad. Yeah, you're so right. yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe it. I would say it maybe depends on how often a fight breaks out and how much how hungry they are. Yeah, I would say so. And the the, the vampire kind of you know law, the vampire kind of rules of this, they're pretty classic, right? Crosses wooden stakes all of that kind of thing obviously daylight is a big thing for them hence dust till dawn um but uh yeah they're they're pretty much your kind of classic vampires in that regard aren't they i think yeah and again actually you get a really similar conversation yeah. like you do in interview with the vampire where they're going through it they're like okay well what do we know that works mm-hmm. crosses we know you know um and then seth sort of says this is why it's important that jacob is still a man of faith because yes. um, he's able to like bless the ward he says you know if 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 you're still a man of faith, then, you know, we've got you as sort of a weapon in your own right, which is very cool. Yes, that's Um, very cool. And then he does the thing with the baseball bat and the pump action shotgun where it's like a cross and a gun at the same time (laughs) so good that's amazing i mean that's the thing it's like suddenly we're in a film that is designed to be you know watch it at midnight with an audience and just like cheer every moment right every kill every five minutes it's and 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 they are like they're spectacular the i should say the makeup effects were done by robert kurtzman who obviously at this point had already done he had done night of the creeps he did nightmare on elm street dream warriors he did the makeup and special effects for some of the other nightmare on elm street sequels he did tremors uh loads of like great army of darkness the evil dead sequel as well oh and he did evil dead too as well so He's like a master. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It it, it does make a lot of sense because it's that kind of like almost cartoony looking, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So you can see that, yeah. And you even get cartoony makeup effects. But at this point, I mean, it's it's been, there's been um, sort of script wise a fair amount of like, 
like laugh to yourself, like amusing moments in the script. Mm -hmm. But you get stuff like when Sex Machine turns into a vampire and he's like, he's trying to hide it. And so he'll like see that his hand is gone. And so he'll like, he'll like sort of like cartoonishly sort of hide it behind his back. Or he's sort of running his teeth along his, running his tongue along his teeth. (laughs) And then his eyes will sort of widen. And then when he comes over to the other like biker guy and basically like his hands kind of like spike spider crawl up over his shoulders i love that like all of that stuff like you're right it really does kind of turn quite quite cartoonish at this point and like it is a real departure from what we saw at the beginning of the film but yeah I, like i'm i'm an apologist for it for me personally i i'm into it and i think it works yeah no i mean it's it's so fun and it's like each segment is fun in its own right it's just so mad that it's the same film it's such a handbrake turn <laughs> like even before the vampires are revealed the second we get to that bar it's so weird in you know the pussy man outside the introduction yeah. of sex machine and his little cock gun that yeah, cut, that springs out right it's like what film and he's got in? like he's got a tiny whip yeah that he steals a guy's he, beer he, bottle yeah he with. lassoes things doesn't he yeah. as well yeah it's, it's like great a tiny little whip it's so good as well yeah uh, brilliant but again the 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 stakes so to speak are quite high right, right in this because suddenly we start losing all of main our main characters swiftly mm. so obviously quentin tarantino is the first to go and then before long, you know, Juliette Lewis loses her family as oh well. And God. it's like, it's pretty relentless how many people get killed off in this section, you know? Yeah, and it's it's really, it's... Because there's a bit just before they go into the bar where, you know, where we were talking earlier about Seth sort of being a bit more human and sort of mm. um, making these connections with the family. And he says something like... Um, I feel like we've gotten to a really good place. Uh, you know, you you know that I'm not going to fuck with you and I know that you're not going to fuck with me yeah. or something. And there are a couple of moments when him and Kate have been sort of building this bond as the film goes on, when he's got terrifying Richie oh. in the back yeah. when they're trying to get over the border and they can't shut him up. And so he just like punches him in the face and knocks him out. And mm-hmm. she sort of says like, thanks. Yes. And then... <laughs> When Richie dies, she tries to kind of um, comfort Seth and Seth's not having any of it. Mm -hmm. But you can see that, like, he's sort of touched by it, by, again, because Clooney's a really good actor. He's got, like, a look on his face. Um, And so it means that by this point in the film where actually her family start dying, when Scott and Jacob Mm -hmm. um, both get bitten um, and all very much sort of within this uh, storyline of them sort of looking out for each other and yeah. and they promise Jacob that once he starts to turn, they'll kill him. And at first they can't quite agree to it. And at first Scott like can't pull the trigger and then he gets bitten and then he Mm -hmm. manages and then so Jacob kills Scott to put him out of his misery and then Kate kills Jacob. And like, it's, it's really a lot and like really emotional and you know it does kind of I like that they set up to a certain extent earlier in the film that Kate and Seth are building this bond Mm -hmm. because then by the point that it's essentially just the two of them left you need to believe that you need to believe like why she like trusts him i guess exactly. and why he yeah. would give a shit about her yes there is this kind of mutual respect between them by that point in the film right um but it's kind of sad then what happens to her at the end and i know that obviously the point is he doesn't take her with him because she would be in even more danger and threat where he's going right and like you said he says i'm a bastard i'm not a fucking bastard or whatever like he he's he's um he's doing her a favor by not taking her with him but it's kind of sad that she's just left on her own with no family or anyone I know. on the just mexican has to drive border. the winnebago back yes. home or whatever <laughs> I know. um i wonder as well with his decision and and with his statement about not being a fucking bastard I think there's something there about the perception of her going with him as well mm. that he's like got this young Yes. Nubile thing in tow, especially yeah. with what we've witnessed throughout the film with his brother. You know, she, when she says, like, do you want company? Yeah. She doesn't say, like, 
can I go with you yeah. or don't leave me on my own? Mm-hmm. She says like, do you want company? And I think there's something suggestive in that where like she's yeah. almost thinking like, I don't know, like not necessarily that she's got a crush on him or whatever, but you know, that there's this suggestion that if he were to take her with him, that could be like mm-hmm. really bad, even if just outwardly it could look really, really bad for both of them. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important for him to distinguish him from to from Richie at that point yes. and be like Richie would say yes at this point and I am saying no yeah it's so true it's so true yeah yeah exactly and and so she's she's left hopefully to go off and have a lovely time in her Winnebago like you say she drives I'm off. sure she's fine she yeah fine. she seems pretty capable <laughs> well I mean he gives her a fucking wad of cash so that's true that's true uh yeah it's great I mean it's a, it's a really fun it's just a whole it's really fun that whole section I just I kind of I do miss the great um character dynamics I guess you know that we get in the first half uh but there's some great stuff I also love Fred Williamson in it as Frost the the like a Vietnam veteran guy. Oh, he's so good. And then his vampire makeup is terrifying. Really terrifying. And all the bats fly past him. Oh my it's God. Great. Because he's such an imposing figure anyway. Yes. And then when he gets turned, that is absolutely... And I love with him, there's that lovely little character detail where he's in the middle of this like trucker bar with all of these topless dancers. And he's just trying to stack his dominoes. Yeah. And he's got all these table dancers like rocking the table and knocking them over and I'm like dude go to a different bar if Domino's is this what you're interested in yeah, it's so funny <laughs> he kind of just feels like he wants to be left alone through most of it completely he? yeah, yeah. And no, he's great and he himself was um, kind of a bit like the casting of Pam Greer and Jackie Brown like he was this huge black exploitation star in the 1970s yeah. Fred Williamson as well so again you kind of feel like the casting of these you know peripheral characters all feels quite deliberate in that regard I think definitely so, yeah and yeah. it's it's nice it's like little subtle not too so- subtle homages to you know the films that have kind of influenced you mm-hmm. know the style of From Dust Till Dawn finally I just wondered out of interest have you seen anything that's come after this because it spawned sequels it spawned a TV show there was I think graphic novels all kinds of things that came after this movie have you seen anything that came after it no I've done I've done the classic Becky approach and one and done me too to be Um, honest yeah yeah Yeah. no I don't I don't know anything about it I think I may have heard on the grapevine some um, cautiously favourable stuff about the Netflix show yeah, it ran for like three seasons. So, yeah. you know, you think it would have been successful to a point. Um, yeah. I think I heard not very good stuff about the sequels, the film sequels. Um, mm. Obviously, none of the people involved in the first one had anything to do with it, I think. So, um, and, you know, we've all seen what Weinstein straight to video sequels <laughs> look like as well. So I'm not particularly interested in giving them Only more because money. because you keep making me watch them for your <laughs> fucking Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have you know it's mainly Stevie Webb. Um, <laughs> okay, fine, fine. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's true. So yeah, I'm not going to rush to see those sequels. To be honest, no, um, I shan't rush. The um, like graphic novel sounds interesting, though. I can definitely see because you know there is something. Um, we were talking about the bar scene and stuff being cartoony, but there's definitely yeah. something quite sort of comic book about Absolutely. it. So yeah, that could work really well. It's true. Um, and I think Blood maybe a renders video... very beautifully uh, in comics. Totally, and there's a video game as well. So again, you could see it working really well as a video game i expect yeah you know. definitely um, so there you go well that's it anything else you want to mention before we wrap up on this batshit masterpiece of a film <laughs> no just to i'm no, just looking down the wikipedia it. page now and um quentin tarantino was nominated for a razzie for worst supporting <laughs> actor uh that is outrageous <laughs> Unless he's also been no- nominated for one for every other single one of his roles. That is outrageous. Yeah. If he wasn't nominated for his awful Australian character oh in Django Oh my God, in Django Unchained. It single-handedly ruined that film for me, I think. Uh, so, yeah, exactly. He, he may not be the best actor in the world, but he's no Daniel Day-Lewis, but this is the best he's ever been in this movie. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. That is an outrageous slur. <laughs> There we go. Um, Well, amazing. Well, I'm going to ask you the final question that you brought up earlier. I know you don't have an answer for me, but what is your favourite vampire film? Do you have a top three? Yeah, so what's happened (laughs) 
is I've written a list because there's a difference between, as we all know, good films and your favourite films. And what's happened really recently is I have watched loads of really good vampire films. Okay. But I've only seen them once. And so when I looked on my letterbox and did a little rank by your rating situation. Yes. I was like, okay, well, these are all the ones that I've given like five stars to. But they're not my favourites because I've only seen them once. Interesting. What are the ones you gave five stars to? Let's Get Jessica to Death. Oh. Near Dark. Oh, yes. The Addiction. Mm Mm-hmm. The Hunger, This Will Make You Happy, Daughters of Darkness. <laughs> the correct answer, the best one, Daughters <laughs> of Darkness. Um, so all of these are, to my mind, pretty much perfect vampire films. Mm-hmm. But they're not my favourite vampire films. I think... <sighs> I think it might be from Dust Till Dawn. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I thought that might be your answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like, and if we're talking about ones that I've seen the most and still get the most enjoyment out of, mm-hmm. whether they're actually any good or not, it's like Bram Stoker's Dracula, an interview with oh. a vampire. You know, these are my... Yeah. Plus, I really love Buffy, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yeah. So basically, as long as they were made between sort of 1990 and 1997... They... Oh my God, am I being... I'm so predictable. You're so... You've been so Becky there about it. I yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But no, those are all amazing choices. Bram Stoker's Dracula is oh, just honestly, I mean, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> um, I also want to give a little um, nerdy shout out to a relatively short anime called Blood the Last Vampire. I've heard of this, yeah. Oh, mate, it'll change your life. <gasps> I mean, it won't. Is it short? But it's very good. Yeah, it's quite short. Um and I used, I've still got it on VHS somewhere and I haven't seen it in years because my VHS player is in the loft mm-hmm. um, and I haven't upgraded yet. But that was, uh, you know, remember in the days when you used to have your VHSs and they used to have the little manga ones mm-hmm. with the little um, Red Hot Chili Peppers single on them. Yeah. Symbol. Um, not single, not Red Hot Chili, chili Peppers single. Yeah. That's something different. <laughs> the little like cross guy, yes. the manga. Um so I used to have like Ninja Scroll, um, Ghost in the Shell, Akira, all of this. Uh, Perfect Blue, yeah. amazing. And Blood the Last Vampire was up there with all of them. It is so good. And it's like, it has a bit of, um, in some ways it wouldn't surprise me if Tarantino hadn't seen it because there's a bit of sort of Kill Bill to it actually oh, with her has. sort of yeah. being dressed with a schoolgirl, slicing up things with a, fucking samurai sword um yeah. it's great so that's my that's my nerdy extra pick if nobody's seen blood the last vampire and you can find it then it's really really good oh, i love that excellent good choices um well there you go becky thank you so much as ever we've we've gone on for two hours i know, um, I know. i'm sorry so much to say no don't apologize um <laughs> thank you so much and until next time let people know where they can find you and more of your stuff out there online best place to find me as always is on twitter i am at bunny dark you can listen to my podcast um that we do all about point horror books if you want more of my 90s nonsense um with my best mate and co-host jill nolan which is don't point that horror at me at point horror pod um and if you want to sling me a few quid if you like the sorts of stuff that i do on podcasts and writing um i've got a patreon which is patreon.com forward slash bunny dark yes amazing becky thank you very much thanks mike And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening and a huge thank you to this week's brilliant guest, Becky Dark. That was so much fun. I loved discussing those movies with Becky. I would love to hear what you guys thought of this episode and of these two films. Please do get in touch. You can email me, evolutionofhorror at gmail.com and you can find us on all the socials, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Letterboxd. Don't forget, if you want to discuss this week's episode with fellow listeners, there are two places you can go. You can join our Discord or you can join our discussion group. That's the Evolution of Horror discussion group, which can be found on Facebook. 
If you'd like to support this episode and get treated to regular bonus updates, then sign up to our Patreon, patreon.com slash evolution of horror. You can find all previous seasons and episodes of this podcast on our website, evolutionofhorror.com. And you can find this podcast in all the usual podcast places. If you get a spare moment, I'd be so grateful if you could drop us a little rating or review on Apple Podcasts or whichever podcast app you use, as that really helps us get discovered by new listeners. So, onwards to next week then, and next week we're covering two more mainstream vampire movies that were based on comic books. Next week I'm going to be joined by Chris Hewitt to discuss Blade from 1998, and then Susan Kalman is going to be joining me to discuss 30 Days of Night from 2007. Cannot wait. Join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror. <laughs>